there are 19% women. I know Jasmine did, went into it in a lot more detail, but for the purposes of the overall kind of look at it, there are only 19% women in our collection, um, which meant that in order to really represent women as I felt they needed to be represented in the show, you would have to kind of acquire a number of works. So while it's not a feminist show, it's a deeply ambiguous and really personal look at the kind of broad categories of left and right wing and lineages in my own family, um, but also I think in the broader Australian public, it is kind of bookended by these, these two major acquisitions. The first being this collection up here, which is an incomplete display because the coloured works are taken out of this and on the opposite wall. So this is the Gorilla Girls Portfolio Complete, which we acquired in 2014. This was a kind of, you know, researching this process and acquiring works for the collection is a complicated and long thing. You have to go through a trustee committee, you have to speak to a lot of different people and get a lot of different approvals. And the thing about this particular archive, if I can call it that, though it is accessioned as artwork that are displayed and will be displayed in the future, um, they, are, they are all kind of recent reprints. They're not historical prints. We haven't kind of been able to assemble a collection of those very rare posters from, the ni from 1984 onwards. But we made the decision to acquire the suite of 89 of them because what the Gorilla Girls, of course, are trying to do is to put together a complete archive of their work which can be represented in museums and which looks to that history. And I think the shocking thing about it, of course, is how fresh and how relevant so much of their material is. And I'll show you when we go upstairs some of the particular posters that I think speak to us today. And in particular, the posters where the Gorilla Girls have looked at something they did in 1984, say the statistics of women in the Mona, sorry, MoMA collection, and um, then they've redone it in 2012. They've updated their posters consistently over time. So they have a really interesting relationship to the idea of archive and history. Um, of course, they're, they're constantly updating their stats, and sometimes those stats look worse now than they did in the 80s, which is always the sad part. Uh, laid out in front of them, though, I just kind of wanted to mention this, and I can't go into it in too much detail, is a selection of the archive here in the Art Gallery of New South Wales. These are materials drawn from Pat Larcher's archive of male art, which is about 28 boxes of material just upstairs. It's an incredible collection. Um, I've chosen a very thin slice of it that deals only with a particular project where she and Terry Reese, I think, um, worked together to create a protest exhibition at the University of Sydney Union Gallery, which is now Verge Gallery, um, where they protested, of course, the kind of proliferation of nuclear materials. It was called Art Core Meltdown. The archive itself is really incredible. It's a project that's waiting to happen. The Mail Art Archive, of course, is a, a, a kind of worldwide global exchange, so I don't know how many artists are actually represented in this archive on display, I don't know where they all come from. Most of them haven't actually signed or dated or named their individual materials. It's a process, it was a process whereby people would respond to call outs on the International Mail Art Network, and then it was a, a, a basic process of never returning work. So she's collated an enormous amount of material, but of course, a lot of Pat Larter's own material is not in this archive, it will be in other archives around the world. So in terms of documenting that particular feminist explosion of work, and her work is strongly feminist and has a particularly interesting relationship to pornography and her body, um, that's like a, a, I think a PhD project for someone. Anyone wants to take it up, please go ahead, because it's amazing, but you would have to spend, you, you know, it reaches all around the world, and there's material from many South American artists, American artists, Europeans, particularly Germans were big on male art in this archive. So I've just taken a slice of it to show what I see is an incredibly, um, not deviant, that's not the right word, but you know, like a subversive medium and process and network that were unpublicized worldwide from this time, um, and also to show the kinds of protest materials that were being shown in Sydney many years ago. This is just an install shot, because, you know, my favorite installers here are girls. Jemima and Mary Andrew just did an amazing job, and I just can't help but say how incredible they were in installing this work. They worked so hard for like six days straight just to get these posters on the wall. Um, and just a kind of fun fact, this work, which is a very famous Gorilla Girls work, has actually become the kind of poster image that we're going to use for our contemporary galleries, Avant Card. 
advertising series, That's which genius. I think is really quite um, fun, especially considering, I think it's an interesting way that the gallery can engage with design collecting history and to look at, you know, it's, it's quite subversive, I think, that people are able to pick up a postcard like that that advertises our contemporary galleries and, you know, all the questions that, that are posed by this postcard can then be applied to our own collection. So it's been really important for me, I think, you know, acquiring work by the Gorilla Girls is never enough. It's not like you can bring in a, a single fell swoop poster archive and say, well, hey, we've got feminism in the building now. It's really important that those posters actually answer back to our collecting histories and ask our audiences to ask questions as well. That's the main goal. Then, you know, there's, th there's four rooms in this show and there's an enormous amount of material, about 148 objects in the show by about 20 artists. So, they, those that we know of, of course, because Google really knows as well, count it as one artist because they're an anonymous collective. Um, I'm going to skip ahead because I will be taking you upstairs and look at the other major acquisition for this show, uh, which is Sharon Hayes' Revolutionary Love. I am your worst fear. I am your best fantasy. And this is a work I'm just, I'm just loving watching it unfold in the gallery space. It was an absolute nightmare <laughs> to install. I had my dad and my partner in here at 6 o'clock in the morning inflating balloons. <laughs> there were like 300 balloons, it took us four and a half hours. Yeah. Um, you've, the work consists, it was first and foremost a, a performance project that was part of Creative Times um, Democracy in America in 2008. And Sharon Hayes is a, a queer New York based artist who is deeply engaged with the history of archiving and has, I think you'll see when you look at the work, woven many historical references throughout her text and she is a really powerful commentator on this idea of the relationship of the past to the present and particularly I think in terms of identity politics. But this work initially began as two performance protests out the front of the national conventions, both Democratic and Republican, where all the people who responded to her call out were asked to read aloud these two letters and you can take them away, they're part of the show and they've got printouts upstairs in the exhibition space. The letters are really poetic and um, densely woven with references, and they're very, very personal. They were basically a love letter from a jilted lover, but you can read them, and I think the context of the work asks you to read them as a letter addressed to the kind of body politic and this idea that there's a really fraught and tense relationship between those people who are activists for their own political agenda and their own barricade, which in this case is, is queer politics and queer rights, and the politicians who are really dominating the narrative about that, making promises and then withdrawing them. And it's a really complicated and emotionally charged interpersonal exchange, as Sharon Hayes brings it. So this is just a detail of one of the videos. This was out the front of the Republican National Convention. I want a t-shirt that says lesbian offenders. Um, <laughs> But to look at the relationship between the past and the present and her relationship to the to kind of histories of protest, this is actually the work that, this is a photograph that gives the work its title. So Sharon found this work in the New York Public Library and it's of a woman called Diana Gottschalk, I think I'm pronouncing her name incorrectly, but anyway, um, holding up a, a protest sign in 1970 that reads, I am your worst fear, I am your best fantasy. And it speaks to that fault line of queer politics and particularly the lesbian agenda where really mainstream culture is terrified of lesbians and yet seduced by them at the same time. So that kind of bizarre exchange of being the subject of a, of a heterosexual male fantasy and yet being also seen as a frightening, threatening presence in culture. And it's that fault line that I think she's interested in researching in all of her work. She takes this as the title of the work and then asks all of the kind of all of the contemporary participants in her work to really operate along that fault line. And I've kind of chosen it along with this quote as a way of finishing up this racing through presentation, because I know we're pressed for time, where she says, the whole project of archiving, of documenting that we have a past, is in actuality a desire for the future. 